on the vault. High atop the pastoral center of the Diocese of Camden, you're listening to Talking Catholic. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Talking Catholic. I am your host, your solo host today, Mike Walsh. The, uh, it's the summertime, so everybody is taking their time off, and I'm very happy that they are doing so. I am the only one that hasn't taken vacation yet, and uh, I'm looking for opportunities. So if anyone knows of something I can do for vacation, by all means, give me a heads up. I turned down tickets to go to uh, the Olympics in Paris uh, this week because, quite frankly, that didn't strike me as relaxing. I've always wanted, I've never been to Paris, always wanted to go to Paris, think it'd be a great thing, always wanted to go to the Olympics. But um, I really need, in need of some relaxation, and I'm not entirely certain that uh, hanging out in Paris during the Olympics is where that relaxation is going to be. So if you have any ideas, feel free to, to let me know. As, as you may recall, we do have an email address, and we do love hearing from you guys. So you can email us at uh, talkingcatholic at camdendiocese.org anytime you want. You can also reach out to us on all of our social media, uh, social media, which across the board is at Talking Catholic everywhere. Um, and then uh, check those things out. I do, however, want to talk to you before we get into our interview. I wanted to talk to you about, um, you know, last week we didn't have an episode. We ran for our domestic church media listeners. We ran um, a, a great talk we had at our local Eucharistic Congress uh, with Father Hyde from about a year ago. But last week, if you hadn't been paying attention or hadn't been on your radar, the Eucharistic Congress, the National Eucharistic Congress, was taking place in Indianapolis last week. And I got to tell you, from afar, it absolutely looked beautiful. Uh, the coverage of it that I saw was amazing. You know, the, the fact that there were four pilgrimages coming from basically the four corners of the United States and all descending upon Indianapolis. And then once they got there being greeted by 50,000 Congress uh, pilgrims, goers, folks from around the country, from that region. It was really, it was an impressive display to see. And then, you know, we did some great reporting in the Catholic Star Herald this week about from a number of our pilgrims who was, who was there, including a great column uh, from our Talking Saints co-host, Lori Power, about just how meaningful the experience was for her. You've probably heard a couple of times on the podcast where I've lamented the fact that I'm somewhat jealous of the fact that uh, NCYC exists, the National Congress for uh, uh, Young Catholics, which also takes place in Indianapolis every year. And it's basically a rock concert for young Catholics uh, for the better part of a couple of days. And it's amazing. Matter of fact, you probably heard some young folks a couple of episodes back. We were talking some, to some of the young folks from uh, Egg Harbor Township about their incredible experience having been to NCYZ. And I've lamented in the past that I didn't feel like there was any adult version of this. I mean, you can make pilgrimages to the Vatican and you can make, you know, there are certain smaller events and you can certainly make pilgrimages with your local parish. But being around... 50,000 other people, kind of like being at a rock concert or a football game or a baseball game. We never seem to have that equivalent for us adults. And this was the equivalent. It was morning, noon, and night, everything about the Eucharist, about how the Eucharist, everything that we do emanates from Christ, who is present here in the form of the Eucharist. And we get to interact with the Eucharist every single day if we choose once a week if we're Sunday uh, goers. Um, and that's, that's just a great opportunity for us that, you know, sometimes I think we kind of lose perspective on because we do think about, you know, the day-to-day -day lives, our, our day-to-day -day Catholic lives, you know, whether we're focused on social service or we're, whether we're focused on our prayer life or our spirituality or inside of church. You know, sometimes it's easy to become distracted from, you know, that greater mission we were given by Jesus when he was here on earth. That Eucharistic Congress was a great moment, particularly for those of us, like I've, you know, I've talked about from time to time, you know, my spiritual life, because I'm so focused on day-to-day -day matters within the Catholic Church. I think sometimes my spiritual life um, uh, falters, not falters, but I can be distracted away from. That Congress was outstanding into refocusing on why we do what we do. It's, in, it's important to do what we do, but we can't lose why we do what we do. 
Um, and it's, uh, and that, that couple of that four or five days in Indianapolis and the coverage that I saw from it were, were really impressive. The, the, the speakers who were there were outstanding. One of our own speakers, Andres Arango, uh, was there presenting, um, for the Latinos in attendance. And uh, he had, he too uh, had a column in the newspaper and really reflected on what a wonderful experience it was. I'm also happy to say that in a couple of weeks, I think, I think on August 1st, uh, it'll come out after that, but I think on August 1st, I'm going to do a recording with a number of the pilgrims who were there, including our beloved uh, Lori Power and um, a friend of the show, Sister Cecilia, is going to be on there. I know we always like to hear from Sister Cecilia. And um, anyway, it's going to, we are going to have a conversation about it. It's going to be, it's going to be, I hope, uh, a wonderful, I hope they're, they're going to come back and inspire me. You know, you can only get so much through a two dimensional screen. So I'm hoping that the, the presence here will, will be meaningful. And don't forget that it's, you know, those interactions, those personal interactions, that's why those things are so important. You know, we've been, I get asked all the time, you know, you guys seem to have been, you know, uh, drawing back on your live streams. And that's true. You know, that's that that was intentional. Um, sort of coming out of COVID, we really wanted to reemphasize how important it is to come together to be with people to be in the presence of people uh, to feel, you know, you, you know, there's the great parable of, you know, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. You know, that's an important thing to remember. And, we, and I know there are certain times you can't get to things. Or maybe, you know, in your life, you are, you don't have the ability to get the things and in those areas, you know, a live stream or seeing things on television or YouTube are really important. And, you know, I'm never going to want to shy away from that. And it's in service to those people. But I also don't want to use, don't want people who can come together to use those as crutches not to come to get, uh, not to come together. So it's, it's a balance, but, um, but listen, be active in your communities. If you know anyone who's been to the Eucharistic Congress, ask them about it. Uh, and I hope uh, hope next week or two weeks from now when that podcast airs, you'll uh, you'll be inspired by it as well. Because let's face it, you, you've heard a number of the pilgrims that we've had on the show over the years talk uh, to pilgrimages to different areas. You can hear in their voice how how touched they are by things. So um, I hope you'll you'll enjoy that and avail yourself of that opportunity. But today we have a special guest on, somebody I've been wanting to have on for quite some some time. She is the new, not quite as new, but the new executive director of Catholic Charities of South Jersey, Dr. Maria Elena Hallion. Great to see you. Thank you for joining us in the vault today. Happy to be here. <laughs> so we're recording on a lovely Friday in the in July. The Always Dangerous Friday podcast, so I may be a little punchy today. I'm giving you a little warning there. But uh, yeah, you you came on board in March? March 18th. March 18th. And, uh, you know, we've had we've done a number of Catholic Charities podcasts over the years. Uh, it's a lot of the same voices coming back, but this is a brand new voice. And we wanted to talk to you about you a little bit and sort of like where you came from and what you've seen in your three, four months here on the boots on the ground in South Jersey. This is a, this is a great opportunity for, I like to say, I love when new people join us because it's a great opportunity for new blood and new ideas and new enthusiasm. Um, so let's talk about you a little bit, however. So where do you come to us from? So most recently, I come from a small grassroots nonprofit where I was the inaugural executive director, mm -hmm. uh, really wonderful program, uh, providing all types of services for the most vulnerable uh, in Cape May County. Mm -hmm. So I was there a little over a year um, to uh, look at their programming and delivering of services and to bring visibility and support to the organization. Um, the program there had uh, meals, six days a week. They offered clothing, uh, showers, um, advocate services, um, everything you could think of that someone that would come to their door that was vulnerable, um, you know, would be would be in need of. And so is a perfect transition into Catholic Charities and the role here. It is. It, you know, that's certainly something that um, Catholic Charities in South Jersey is is well known for is our service to the the poor and needy. Of course, this Catholic Charities um, is a hefty one, has a number of programs even beyond working with those folks. Um, now, prior to that position, you actually had a, you had a long career in academia. I mean, uh, you, you really, like, you were 
a academic prof- professional from back in the years. 23 years at Cabrini, was it? Correct. Wow. Correct. 23 years at Cabrini University. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how that sort of sparked my interest in social justice and this work, how it lends itself well to some of the things that I'm now responsible for. So I was a professor and department chair of health and exercise sciences. Um, we had we were putting people through the curriculum so that they would go on and do work in all kinds of fitness and health and wellness and nutrition fields, mm-hmm. which is really a caring industry. It really is a service industry if you think about it. And while at Cabrini, uh, you know, founded in Mother Cabrini and her her complete commitment to social justice and serving the vulnerable, the faculty are encouraged to take their areas of interest um, and transition or translate that um, to reach a broader studi- uh, student audience mm-hmm. in terms of not just those in their, their major. So my interest was in childhood obesity and the drastic rise in rates domestically um, and what are the factors that contribute to that. And some of the main ones are accessibility to affordable and healthy foods for families. Mm -hmm. So that starts to look a little bit like food insecurity and touches on the outskirts of hunger issues. And I began to build a network because of the courses that I taught around that and my regional symposiums that I organized while I was there. So I was collaborating with a lot of experts in the field uh, and learning from them and building a network around that. So um, that was prior to my transition into nonprofit leadership. That that is, you know, it's well known in in the diocese and on this podcast. I love talking to academics. I can talk to academics for for hours. Matter of fact, I encourage you to talk on this podcast for hours. Uh, don't ever feel like you need to, to cut your story short. The um, so you have so you have this this background in social service. You have this background in academia, and I'm happy to report you also have a background in the faith as well. You're active in your parish. What what parish have you been a part of? So I'm presently uh, officially a parishioner of St. Clair of Assisi in Gippstown. Mm-hmm. Um, St. John's in Paulsburg was where I was baptized and married, so that that church is no longer there when they all the mergers, and um, which is in Paulsburg, and then St. Clair is in Gippstown. More recently, I do attend mass in Wildwood and Wildwood <laughs> Crest, which I love. They have a phenomenal choir, but mm, um, yeah. In my time at St. Clair, I've done uh, faith formation. I did the children's liturgy. I um, was a Eucharistic minister. I decided to become a Eucharistic minister the year my daughter got her first communion. Aww, so then I would always remember so that that's when I did that. So, uh, you know, I've had service and uh, contributions to the parish. Mm-hmm. So... Well, now that's 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 something I enjoy hearing as well. You know, I, I really think that particularly when you're in the in a leadership position in a diocese like this or any diocese, um, you know, you really want to have people. You, I was talking earlier about how you can get lost in the mundane and stuff like that. So having directors and executive directors who have, um, you know, strong faith lives is incredibly important because it's easy. It's easy to get lost. It's easy to, to kind of lose our way. Even I mean, I I'm with clergy all day long. And and even I can sort of, you know, occasionally glaze over a little bit and forget why I do this. And the, even though we're surrounded by icons and statues and crucifixes all over my offices, sometimes I can lose my way and just think about the the crisis I'm dealing with at the time. You are working in a position now where, I mean, you have you're going to be working with people that um, uh, clients that are in desperate need, and it's easy to sort of forget the the faith angle here. You've had the benefit now of of getting to meet everybody at Catholic Charities. Um, what have you sort of like uh, come away in your first several months here of of your new colleagues in the in the Catholic Charities field? So, and maybe we'll circle back to mm-hmm. more things about my time at Cabrini mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. how it was so easy to keep your spirituality and your faith alive in a Catholic institution where yeah. it was so vital. And 
talk a little bit more about some things there that have led me here. But in my short time here, in my very, very brief initial time here, what I was um, so encouraged by was the people that I was meeting at Catholic Charities and the the team there, the staff there that um, does amazing work every single day. I was impressed by their longevity um, to the organization and their commitment for the work that they do. So that was very encouraging to come in and see that really early. Mm -hmm. The the organization, it has so much opportunity. I mean, they've done amazing things, but there's still, there's so much opportunity and it's going to be made possible because of that team that's there and that have welcomed me and have tolerated me <laughs> and who have supported me in in my ideas and my real deep investigation. I'm still I still have more to learn. Oh sure. But what I have learned is th- they're doing amazing work across all six counties and that um they'll never be a shortage of how they can serve. That just mm-hmm. that need is there and will be growing, and um, we have a lot of ideas about how I can help them, support them in the work that they do. That's what I see as my role: supporting my leadership team so they can support their team, so that when they have a client in in a counseling room across from them, they have everything they need and they are supported in what they have to provide for that client. Yeah. You know, the, the work of Catholic charities, particularly in South Jersey is, is, is very well known. And, uh, over the years, depending on the, depending on the time and the needs of the clients, uh, you know, it, they've serviced anywhere from 20,000 to 30,000 people in the time that I've been there it fluctuates every year is, you know, depending on, you know, the needs of the people. Um, and, uh, you know, they've made for themselves because like you said, the quality of the people who are working there, uh, and the reputations that they've built, you know, um, it is a reputation for the organization at large. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other programs that Catholic Charities of South Jersey, like some of the highlighted ones that you've been, uh, you know, that you're really proud of and and have really gained a lot of reputation uh, for for South Jersey? Oh, absolutely. So um, they, we have, we serve six counties. We have brick and mortar in all six counties. Even though the counties are large and diverse, we do have a physical structure with staff there. And Mm -hmm. I don't know that everybody realizes that. We also have two counties that have two satellite offices. So we are the stewards of financial support from a variety of sources that allow us to financially support our clients if they meet the criteria Mm -hmm. and the eligibility for that. Sometimes people get confused that that's all that we do, but um, it's just one part of what we do. And I see that as homelessness prevention, utility support, um, back rent, security deposits to get them from one insecure living situation to a more secure living situation. We also offer food. So we have food pantries in almost every county. We offer free diapers, Mm -hmm. which is again, a cost to people. We have a beautiful, extensive veteran program. Yeah. Uh, that is uh, funded well and staffed well, where we are really helping veterans get secure housing for long term. We also have referrals for uh, mental health support. We have a beautiful addictions healing program that operates through some of the parishes That also can be a little confusing to people, but it's really support for loved ones of those that are addicted, substance abuse or misuse, but also referring to other agencies and so forth. We have a um, immigration, refugee and asylum, um, a migrant program that is 
helping those that make their way to the counties in the diocese uh, for a variety of, of similar support. I actually met uh, just recently, there was an Afghani event um, in uh, South Jersey, one of the parks, and I got to meet your Afghani representative there. This was a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it's the first time I had an opportunity to meet him. He's a former refugee himself, and he's now one of your part-time caseworkers. The, you know, the, the, the times that I've worked with Middle Eastern refugees over the years, I am always impressed by their love of being here, their, their generosity of spirit, their joy. I had, I was, I happened to be, it was a last minute thing. And, um, the, uh, I had like 30 minutes to get there. So I went as the photographer and my, my colleague, Jen Morrow, she went as the, uh, reporter and, um, I had so many <laughs> Afghani refugees coming up and asking me just to take their photos, not for, I mean, for themselves. And they were so joyful and so happy. And it was such a lovely experience. And the kids were there, you know, it's, 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 it's moments like that, that I, you know, I used to say often when I got a chance to go over there more often. Um, if I was having a bad day, I would go to the Catholic charities to, to perk up my spirits because the work you do with the clients and being around the clients who are going through diff- very difficult times, but being around that staff and those people and the comfort they're able to provide and the opportunity that they're able to provide, particularly for people new to the country who don't know really what to expect. I did actually, I, I live in Glassboro, New Jersey. I didn't realize that that had become an Afghani uh, refuge in Glassboro, which makes me very happy because I often say, uh, you know, it's a love-hate relationship with Rowan University for me. Uh, My neighborhood has become a lot more uh, student uh, renters, which, you know, is fine. That's great. But um, I often say, give me me, uh, a neighborhood of Middle Eastern uh, refugees versus uh, (laughs) college school kids, (laughs) to be honest with you. But um, but anyway, it's it was a great experience, and that's one of those, you know, small things that you you don't really think about, and then you you meet them and you hang out with them, and it just brings you such such joy. So I, I love that program. Well, I will I will share with you honestly that is a, um, a a population that I have not had a lot of experience serving. Mm-hmm. So it is one of the areas that I need to learn more about. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are resources certainly for me to do that my colleagues, of course, and then organizations like the Office for New Americans in New Jersey. Um, And I'm doing more reading and researching around the terminology. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it is, it can be complex. Oh, absolutely. It can be very complex. Um, But I'm enjoying learning more about that population that is in such great need. And, and we, you know, the Catholic Church has a commitment, a commitment to that. So I, well, that, yes. that, that proves just how important Catholic Charities is in South Jersey and, and, and every day. I've, I've had the uh, benefit of getting to meet a lot of Catholic Charities uh, leaders from across the United States. And if you've been to one Catholic Charities, you've been to one Catholic Charities. They're all different. They're like little snowflakes. They, they all have different things that they work on and different things that they focus on. But um, the, the beauty of it is, is even in, in South Jersey, Catholic Charities of South Jersey is so diverse in so many tentacles and who you work with. You know, in the time that I've been here, I've seen Catholic Charities work a lot with the St. Vincent de Paul Society. Uh, you certainly work with our Vitality Catholic Healthcare Services all the time. Um, and this, you know, we've actually highlighted a number of those interactions where somebody will come through Vitality's door in need of service and they immediately call over the Catholic Charities or vice versa, but they'll immediately call the Catholic Charities and be like, can you help this person with housing? Can you help? Them? And if those links didn't exist, you know, these are people that would likely fall between the cracks. But because of our Catholic nature, we're able to, to help folks. And it's not like we're just helping Catholics. We're helping anybody. Exactly. You know? Which I remember when I was doing my research for the interview, we help um, everyone, not because they're Catholic, but because we're Catholic. And exactly. I said, oh, that, that really needs to be a little bit more prominent in, <laughs> uh, in some of our, uh, you know, wording and, you know, exposure. And I like you talking about those collaborations, even within the diocese and with the diocese affiliates, mm-hmm. uh, like the Center for Law and Justice. But I'm also really eager to build some partnerships with other agencies that, have uh, expertise and skill and resources that we may 
not have fully. And so I'm looking forward to, you know, more of that as well. But within the diocese already, there's a lot of opportunity. There really is. Even even at the parish level, you, I mean, you mentioned this earlier, you know, knowing that our parishes can reach out to us at any time when they're in need. Um, and there are certain, and I know that this is something uh, Bishop Sullivan and, and our future bishop, Bishop Williams, uh, you know, really is looking for even more integrations between Catholic charities and the parishes, which I think will be incredibly beneficial. You know, it's a hard job. You know, Catholic charities, you know, any social service agency, as you well know, no, any surf, social service agency, it is a complex beast, um, particularly when you get into things like grants and things like that, because you are limited. That's, you know, I, I think a lot of people, I have the benefit of having worked in uh, nonprofits and social services for a long time. And I remember the first thing me having to understand was, you know, grant funded programs can only work for those. You may have a budget of $10 million, but if that $10 million is earmarked or five of that $10 million is earmarked for just one program, then it gets to work on just that one program and you can't divert it somewhere else, which is why fundraising is so important. You've certainly gotten to know our, our fundraising folks pretty quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, fundraising for Catholic charities is very important. Matter of fact, we, you know, I, I don't know if we've announced this on the podcast yet. As a matter of fact, we can talk about your annual dinner coming up and, uh, and who it's going to support. So the Catholic Charities annual dinner this year is on October 24th. It's being held again at the Resorts Hotel and Conference Center in Atlantic City. Um, your special honoree this year, would you like to announce who it is? Uh, Chief David Harkins. Yes. From uh, the Gloucester Township Chief of Police and also a deacon. Yes, in our diocese, that's right. Um, and well known to, to many people in South Jersey. He's a... Um, he, I've had the pleasure of working with him basically since the time I've gotten here, both as a chief and as, as a deacon in the diocese. Great guy, really community focused. Um, you know, Gloucester Township Police is a, Gloucester Township was a very large area in South Jersey, as most of the township incorporated areas are, it covers a lot of square miles. And he has always had this, this, this perspective on how important it is for the officers to be in the community, not just, you know, from a law and order perspective, but to getting to understanding their communities and supporting their communities and supporting the organizations in the com communities as mo as best the uh, police department can do. And the fact that he also is, I mean, you see Chief Harkins walks to a, a room and the first thing you're going to say is that guy's a cop because <laughs> he, he gives off that cop energy. But then you meet him as a deacon and you realize, you know, that pastoral sense to him and his family life and stuff like that. Um, it, it may seem peculiar for some folks. This is actually the second chief of police that the that Catholic Charities uh, predates you. Uh, Catholic Charities is honored. It actually honored my uh, high school uh, fellow graduate of Gloucester Catholic, uh, 1990, um, the former chief of police for the city of Camden, uh, or actually in that time, it, it, it converted into a county, uh, county-based uh, police department at that point. But uh, yeah, um, and it was it was a great. It was actually before I got here, and he was very well deserved. He, and much like Chief Harkins, he had been really dedicated to community policing, and it was a natural fit for Catholic Charities to honor him then, and is absolutely uh, appropriate for Catholic Charities to honor him now. So I was very pleased when when we saw that happen. And like in previous years, this will be your first one, but. Um, that event will also be honoring um, uh, Disciples of Mercy throughout South Jersey. So we'll have, uh, we'll be honoring, uh, every diocese is broken up into deaneries. In the Diocese of Camden, we have five deaneries. So we will be honoring a different Disciple of Mercy, either an individual or a group from around the diocese. And that process is gonna, has already started, actually. We've already put out um, a request for nominations for that. And if you would be interested, if our listeners would be interested in taking part in the Catholic Charities Annual Dinner this year, you can always go to catholiccharitysouthjersey.org slash ccad, or just go to the Catholic Charities homepage and you'll find it on there. But it is a great event to go to. I encourage people to go. I've now had to, I've had a hand in it every year that I've been here. And it's one of my favorite events to be at, to cover. I never get, I, 
The only downside is I never have to actually enjoy myself no. there because I'm always working. That's a shame. It is a shame. But everyone else says they have a great time. Well, I'm really looking forward to it for my first one. And what I envision and what I you know, feel about the day is it's a way to bring recognition to people that really have made a lifelong commitment to, serve, to serving those in need and to serving others. And Chief Harkins is... is when you read about him more on our website and learn more about him, you are going to feel the same way that, that we all feel in, in this selection and his acceptance of this, this honor. What's been really sweet is that as we've told a few people, their responses, if people know him, has been amazing. Oh, like yeah. it's just, that's really just very affirming. And I feel like this event is a way to also thank our supporters and then in, in, uh, enlighten them and share with them some things that might be coming up and happening because of their support, because, of, you know, oh, they, yeah. they, they support us and then what we're able to do over the next year um, for the event. So, uh, you know, from one event to the next event. So I do want people to be thinking about attending and learning more about the honoree. And then when the other awards are the recognitions are finalized. I think you'll be equally as impressed uh, with that. And that, you know, that, that link I sent out earlier, uh, uh, catholiccharitysouthjersey.org slash CCAD, there is also a form on there for uh, nominations. So if you would like to nominate somebody for a Disciple of Mercy Award, by all means, consider that as well. Don't nominate me. I will not get voted in. But uh, there are a lot of great people in our parishes and our communities Catholics who are doing great work in other industries, you know, it's it's a it's a very open process. It can be groups, it can be individuals, and it, it really is a great opportunity to showcase the the wonderful people of South Jersey. So I, I do encourage you to, uh, if you are so interested, consider nominating someone. Every year we get new people, and I love reading through them because it's you know we get a lot not everybody can be awarded we do keep them because we might use them for for future years um, but they are very uh, heartening stories so you're going to enjoy that when those nominations start coming in well I'm looking forward to it and I also love the idea of just people coming together just sort of that collaboration and people from the diocese, people from the community, and of course, people from Catholic Charities. And we really, this event can't happen without the contribution of marketing and communications and, sure. and, and, you know, the diocese. I think it's a good representation of how we we must integrate. We must be integrated and be collaborating. Oh, absolutely. And I don't know how aware people are of that. And I'm looking forward to getting out and talking to the parishes. Um, the bigger the audience, the better for me. And um, looking forward to uh, getting an audience with St. Vincent de Paul mm -hmm. societies and Knights of Columbus because all, um, and pastors because often these are how people in need are, you know, finding us, you know, and making their way to us. So I think the dinner really represents, uh, you know, what, how we rely on each other to do what we do. You know what? That's a that is a it is a perfect um, uh, microcosm of Catholic charities in that regard. And it is and it, and actually it is a number of people that, that comes together. I have to say that the development department for the diocese of Camden does most of the heavy lifting for that event, and uh, they do. You know, Stacy Napolitano has been on this uh, podcast a few times, and Leslie Visco they do wonderful work. So and their colleagues and the staffs and the staffs of Catholic charities. It's a it's a blast. My staff just likes to go and and. Uh, enjoy the food oh, and, yeah. and drink. You. Thank so, you yeah. for correcting me on that. <laughs> my, my, <laughs> I, on the other hand, don't get to enjoy myself at all. But my staff has a great time. They, but they buy, they, buy, they buy their tickets and they enjoy themselves and they should do that. Now, I, I do want to go back to something you had brought up earlier. As I said about how even amongst all the trappings of the church, sometimes I can get lost in my my day to day routine. Um, but you said when, in your time in Cabrini, also surrounded by the trappings of the church and the faith, and um, that that was helpful to you. So how was that helpful? To it you? was so helpful. For the one, we had this beautiful chapel, um, you know, on campus where you know the, all the masses, all the. Um, uh, you know, days that, uh, uh, holy days of obligation and what have you. And I said, oh, let's just walk right from one building to the next building. So that was beautiful. And I remember um, the first time I was in a meeting and we started the meeting with a prayer. And I said, I cannot believe this is where I work. And this is what happens here. <laughs> I just cannot believe this. And um, so, you know, very fortunate in that regard. And that, again, that 
unified commitment to mission is just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I really uh, was very comfortable there and I really um, thrived there. Um, The other thing that happened while I was there that has been instrumental in my transition from academic leadership to nonprofit leadership is the Faculty Mission Academy, which was a a funded program, a newly funded program that allowed faculty um, to uh, do a year-long immersion experience um, around uh, Catholic identity, um, uh, uh, Catholic social teaching principles, and mission. And it, it's a year-long experience with three to four touch points where we left the campus and did um, events um, and, and met with special people, you know, doing amazing work. And then one of the trips was um, you, you would travel and you had choices of where you traveled. And one, the year I participated in that, I did the first year, you had to put a little application in and show how you were going to use this time and translate that into your class and work with your students, of course, um, I went to the Romero Center in uh, Camden. Really? And that's that's where I stayed. And we we did work and service in Camden. And that's... that was a long time ago. <laughs> so I need to reconnect with the Romero Center. But I think that's kind of ironic. That oh, absolutely. Now my that, home office are. is I, now. I got news for you. There's touch points all over this. Um, I, I never mentioned this on the podcast before, but my they, people do know that I'm a St. Joe's University graduate, and uh, class of 1994. My college girlfriend, class of 1995, was a Cabrini college graduate. And I actually spent a lot of time over Cabrini over the years while she was there. And I will tell you that my first indoctrination into social justice was because I had a girlfriend at Cabrini, who also happened to be a uh, uh, an RA, and she became involved with uh, I guess it was Habitat for Humanity, and she did she did a um, she did a trip to Kentucky or West Virginia or something like that to do stuff like that. I was so enamored by it that my senior year at St. Joe's, I did signed up for Habitat for Humanity. It was a it was a life altering event where I went down I went down to West Virginia. And, no, I'm sorry, I went to Kentucky and got to hang out in the, the coal mine areas of Kentucky and work with people who were in need. I went around all these different houses. I had a background in, you know, I'd done on, I was like DIY kind of handyman sort of person at that time. And I did all these fix up places and got to meet all these people. And it was an incredible experience. Came back and it really moved me. And when the time came to get into social service, I really felt, you know, that, that moment with Habitat for Humanity really kind of, altered my way of thinking. And I was very open to working in social service after, out of that, all because I had a girlfriend that went to Cabrini University, and it was a, it was a great experience. I love it's, that. It's how those things tend to happen. And she, she went to Cabrini to become a social worker. But anyway, it's, uh, you, know, you have moments like that in your life, and they create these touch points that you move on to things, and it's, it's amazing. It is amazing. And I so loved the first the, – we did it every other year, and I so loved it that the second and third year I was on the planning committee – with other faculties that did it. So I kept, I got to keep going because faculty only got to do it once because they had to move on to other faculty. So I was able to then become on the planning team and then I got to do it for two more years um, and was you know able to help other faculty how to integrate social justice themes, advocacy around social justice issues uh, into their courses and projects and internships and and all of that. So, um, you know, I was, even though I was in academics, I was doing social justice work, you know, via that um, arena uh, before I really, I left Cabrini, which I did in 2021. Mm-hmm. And then worked for six months at a huge food insecurity uh, operation in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, because of one of the people that I had met in my network that I described earlier had an emergency six-month vacancy for their food resource director. And she said, I know that you don't know how to do this, but I know (laughs) that you can do this. And I learned everything. I learned a lot about food um, uh, receiving of donations, food moving, storing, 
um, and, you know, zero food waste yeah. um, from that experience before I was at um, the executive director in Cape May County. You know, it's funny. I, I love hearing stories like this because, you know, you're never sure where you're going to be. I, I was actually, my son is a, is a, going into his junior year and we were having a conversation about, uh, you know, we need to get on the ball with taking some college tours and places to go. Um, and so I said, well, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? He's like, I don't know, Dad. Which is a per- perfectly fine answer. I, I'm not surprised. And then the follow-up question is, well, what inspires you right now? Like, what are you into? And he doesn't really have a lot. And I went, okay, well, that's fine. I went, I went to school to be a history teacher, right? I am doing nothing even remotely associated with history teaching other than that I, you know, it, it taught me how to present. It taught me how to, you know, how to think about the bigger picture, you know, it, it, to, to look back and see what was done in the past, look forward to what could be done better in the future, things like that. So, you know, you don't have to think about, you don't have to, have to go to school and now thinking about what you'd like to do but why don't you think about those areas you'd like to touch on and then you will meet people along the way and that will be what sort of drives you and those yeah you know, i think people i think networking gets a bad gets a bad rap nowadays and i'll tell you why because <laughs> i think some people look at networking as just professional stuff you know you're trying to get ahead and that's not really what networking is networking is making connections learn learning new things these people not, might not be able to help me to get ahead but i do steal ideas from people constantly because I will meet people who have great ideas. I'm like, oh, we can absolutely do that in the diocese or I can do that in my personal life. So these networking opportunities really pay dividends. I That's interesting that you say that because perhaps networking has like morphed into not sounding so positive, mm-hmm. but it's not what I mean mm-hmm. when I say networking um, because you, there's so much to garner from someone who's been down a path that you are potentially interested in and and you do not know where things are going to go in um in a, in about two and a half years i've been on the job market twice yeah and 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 i used my network to explore um and research and someone would introduce me to someone else and i'm not you know i'm here i because of Mike Sims, because <laughs> I met him at my last mm-hmm. place. We connected. I had never explored employment opportunities in the diocese or Catholic charities uh, and started to do that um, and, um, you know, saw this position posted and read the description and thought, oh, I think I have some of those uh, experiences <laughs> and qualifications. Let me go ahead and apply. And um, it's much bigger, much more complex than my organization, you know, my previous organization. But I do feel uh, equipped to work with the staff here and, and you know, get some, some really great things, um, really great things done. The word I've been liking to use, Mike, is enhance. Oh, yeah. Enhance because that there's no negative connotation with that, and everything you know can use um, enhancement. So, so what you're saying is when you when you graduated from East Stroudsburg University, you never saw yourself as a Catholic Charities Executive Director. Uh, no, I did not. <laughs> Remember, that's not my final degree. Mike. No, 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 that's, no. That's not. Oh no, 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 no. When uh, I graduated from East Stroudsburg, uh, I was pretty focused on um, getting a, a position in preventive medicine, which, mm. which I did. Yeah. Um, and then, um, moved on from there, decided I can't get enough of school. Let me go back and get a PhD. <laughs> and then knowing at that time that I wanted to, to have my uh, work life be in higher education. Yeah. No, I, you know, it's, it's great. Um, I was having a conversation with one of our colleagues today, as a matter of fact, we were discussing sort of how, you know, people move on, to, to the next steps, you know, nowhere in my career line, I've had a lot of different jobs. It's just the nature of PR. You bounce around a lot. Um, I've had a lot of different jobs and I couldn't have predicted ever having anyone, any, any single one of them being in corporate law. That was not my plan. You know, as a, as a PR person, as a lawyer, uh, being in nonprofit work was never my expectation. I never thought I'd be the communications director for a diocese. I never thought I'd be on the board of directors for the Catholic media association. Like these are things that as an 18 year old, you know, thinking about his college <laughs> life, I would have ever predicted. But I will say, and, you know, I guess we're kind of getting into sort of professional development stuff here, uh, making sure that you're open to things, making sure you're open to new ideas, and making sure that you have a well-rounded skill set really does kind of pay off for if you, if you particularly if you sort of have a, 
desire for a leadership position. Not everybody wants, trust me, not everybody wants to have to deal what we have to deal with as leaders, right? There are days that I would be more than, I've, I've been talking to people recently about all I want to do is learn how to do uh, boat repair. And so I can just sit on a marina all day, fix engines, and then call it quits when the sun goes down. But but I also have a drive to, to do things like this. And, you know, as we talk about, you know, our professional backgrounds and stuff like that, making those connections and being open-minded to new ideas and having a desire to learn more. I mean, listen, I've met people who have gotten PhDs. You are all a unique animal. That It takes a special type to decide to go through that process. How long did your PhD process take you? You don't want it. Oh, no, <laughs> that's, no, that's everyone's No, three oh. years and four months. Oh, that's not bad at all. No, it's a record. Wow. I'm pretty sure it was a record at Temple. Oh, wow. Three years and four months because I wasn't, I was there, I had a GA. I That's when I first started teaching at the college level. Mm-hmm. I'd never done that before, but that was my GA was to teach and I loved it and I knew this was, you know, my calling. Um but a lot of people that I was in school with had their careers already and they were fitting this degree around their work and their families. Yeah. So I did not have to do that. So I really surged ahead uh, and got it done very, very quickly, mm-hmm. which is not common. But um, I think getting a PhD is a test of perseverance. That, that's how I look at it. I don't. I think anyone is capable of doing it. It's just... You have to keep going forward um, because no one will do that for you. Yeah. So that's what I that's what I tell people. It's a test of perseverance. I will admit I've I've pondered the idea many times, and I'm like, I don't think I, I don't think I can do what I do now and get a PhD simultaneously. Because otherwise, I'll, when I get it, I'll be 65 years old, <laughs> and at that point, do I need a PhD? We're not dating ourselves here, are we? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think so. I didn't say the year I graduated no, you did high not. school or college nope. yet, because I promised I was not going to state <laughs> nope. those two years. You, as far as anyone concerns, everyone thinks you're 23. I, I what I do, what I did counsel my students on, and young people that seek out my advice now regarding uh, higher, you know, degrees, master's degrees, or PhDs. I feel like you have to know what that's going to get you. You have to sort of be clear as to what that is going to afford you to be able to do next. And if it's not clear, that can get in the way of that perseverance. So that's my sort of thought on that for people thinking about that next degree. I don't think you can get a master's just to get a master's or get a PhD just to get a PhD it would be to what is this going to allow me to do? And then you're driven to, to, to finish it. If you don't mind that piece of advice. Oh no, I, I listen, I think I, you're absolutely right. When I got my master's degree, it was very specific. Uh, I wanted it in PR and I happened to start it. Actually, st- I started while I was in PR jobs and then I, I switched jobs at one point and thank God. And I mean that thank, seriously, I pray to God that I, I made that switch because I got, gone into corporate law and all of my PR work had to be elevated from where I was. And fortunately, my classes lined up perfectly with what I was doing at that law firm and gave me the ability to really understand this new job and bring a lot to it. And then as I moved on elsewhere, it really brought a lot more. So my my master's degree far exceeds the value of my bachelor's degree. And I have to imagine that a PhD would be would be similar in that regard. Yeah, and I think where some of the overlap is with, you know, getting those advanced degrees, if there's any young people listening, is so, so you know, you build skills on time management and organization and being able to prioritize. And these are things I need in this role right now. Right? <laughs> that so is true. They're, they're, that you know, is true. They, these are things that I need in this role right now. Um, it is an independent v- venture. This job is not independent. I have you know, a lot of really good people that are counting on me. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, depending, you know, they they depend on me, but I also am counting on them and depend on them, you know, as well. So um, the organization's been through a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. And again, there's, you know, there's a it's, it's very encouraging the people that are here and what they want, you know, for the organization and, you know, um, next 10, 20 years, you know, whatever, whatever that might look like for them. So I'm very committed to having um, my energies 
um, go to the staff yeah. um, and making myself available for them. Even though I don't know everything that they know, um, I still feel that I can, I have an open door policy and I can, I like that you said about being open because you do need that. I need to be open in this new role for people who want to meet me and for people that have things to share and that I'm open to what they can also you yeah. know, provide for me. So that doesn't go away. That, that's been my motto as, an, as a leader for a long time as an executive, which is I, I know what I know. And I don't know what I don't know. So I better listen to people who might know more than me. And that's that's not to say that I got a hole in my game or any leader has a hole in their game. It's That's human nature. I mean, we only know what we know. Um, and sometimes my folks will come to me with an idea and I'm like, okay, that's not going to work. We're not doing that. But sometimes they come up with an idea like I had never even considered that. Thank God you said that. That is a fantastic idea. Let's move on it and see, see what happens with it. Having that openness to new ideas, going back to this professional development conversation, is really beneficial for leaders. And, and the leaders I've seen fail, not here, but in previous places, were ones that were closed off to new ideas, thought they had everything nailed down and didn't realize that they were missing out on stuff and not listening to learned people. I mean, great ideas come from anywhere. You know, they come from volunteers, they come from custodial staff, they come from secretary staff, they come from interns, they, they come from all over the place. They may not be able to have the full knowledge of a situation because, you know, we're usually more aware of those kinds of things. But those nuggets of ideas, those basic ideas, or even sometimes a full-blown plan, man, be open to, to getting new ideas from people. Do not be closed off. Just, just a good life lesson right there. Not, not I, one that you need to know. We but, are in agreement yeah, on that. So, well, that's that's wonderful to hear. So, you know, in our last uh, three minutes, <laughs> what uh, do you have any, like, uh, specific plans for the remainder of your first year? Or uh, you're hoping the areas to get into? or Well, I, I, I did actually finally put some goals for the to the end of the year on paper. Nice. I, I, I um, refrained from doing it too soon, um, but I did I did put some things down. Really looking, uh, it, you know, there's there's several of them, but wanting to improve um, the positive image of Catholic charities uh, in the diocese and in the public, and I think that's going to happen through education, mm -hmm. um, educating about what we do, um, what we don't do, what we are not aligned to do. Um, I want to be working on. Um, perhaps changing people's minds that might look at some of the people we serve with judgment or criticism. Mm -hmm. So again, that's education sure. about how quickly someone could be in a crisis situation, especially sure. in this economy. Yep. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that. We are building the team. Um, so, so that's exciting. Um, I'm, tapping into um, Catholic Charities USA. So I'm looking forward to some more um, interactions there. Um, and, you know, I'm really, as I already stated, looking for partnerships, very, very visible and uh, mutually um, beneficial partnerships um, in all the counties and still really carefully looking at the operations in all the counties mm -hmm. and making sure, you know, a, a deep assessment. And uh, I'm looking to put together some nice data, um, you know, looking forward to being able to really tell uh, a full story of, of what we do. So nothing too lofty. Um, but, um, it, you know, with comes the website and some marketing pieces, sure. which you and I have already been talking about and, um, you know, continuing to uh, grow and support the staff. So I'll be honest, I'm very excited for you. I, um, I remember what my first days here were like and getting to work with Catholic Charities and then getting to learn all the new parts. And then you, you, you're only at the very beginning stages of, of the w wider world of Catholic Charities. I know you're going to go to the annual gathering later this year, the, the na their national event. And I'm actually going to another national event in December. And um, I, I will admit that, you know, the, the relationships I've made with Catholic Charities folks are, are very meaningful. Very meaningful. Um, I've never met, I don't think I've met one that I don't like yet, of <laughs> colleagues both in the diocese and out of the diocese. So I really do think you have a, uh, a wonderful future there. And I think uh, they are uh, lucky to have you or blessed to have you, I guess might be the better way to put it. And uh, I think this is going to be a great relationship with you, with you there. And I, 
as someone who will be assisting you with your communications and branding, I'm very much looking forward to it. Well, I thank you for this opportunity, and I thank you for everything that you've already helped me do in this short time here. Well, it's absolutely been my pleasure. Uh, Thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate that. And to all of our listeners, we'll talk to you again next week. See you, everybody.